All right, so we're going to get started. Welcome to a new Current Conversations. We are really excited to get to talk uh, tonight with uh, the two new trustees of the Cold Spring Village Board. We have Kathleen Foley and Heidi Bender joining us tonight. And we also have our senior reporter, Michael Turton, who's going to be um, running the questions about all things uh, Cold Spring. So we know everybody probably has a lot of questions. You can send them through the Q&A button that you'll find along the bottom of your screen. And we'll get through as many as we can in the time we have. So leaving it to Mike to get started with some questions. Hey, thanks, Teresa. And uh, congratulations, Heidi and Kathleen, on uh, getting elected to the board. Thankfully, we don't have to wait for recounts or mail-in ballots or lawsuits to be settled. Uh, so we have lots of questions. Now let's get talking about village life, village government. And I will get to priorities in just actually my second question. But my first question is really, um, you know, I think most of us had favorite subjects in high school. So I'm wondering, and other subjects we didn't care for that much, and I'm wondering just in terms of your personal interest, what areas of local government, village government really interest you the most in terms of stuff you'd like to work on? Not necessarily the priorities, that could be a different question, but what are your areas of interest in terms of village governance? Heidi, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, well, I think one thing that draws so many people to Cold Spring is the outdoor spaces. And so that's definitely um, an area of interest. Uh, so parks and rec, I guess it would be. Um, but especially, you know, we moved here and we moved into an apartment. We've um, been in the apartment the entire time we've lived here. And those outdoor spaces are just so valuable to us um, versus a couple now as a family. Um, so yeah, I, I love the village for, for its outdoor spaces. And that's one of the things. Um, of course, budget is always of interest. I mean, budget lies behind everything. You can't really have anything without looking at the budget. So that's always a very interesting thing. Um, I can't say I was particularly drawn to numbers in school, but, but I, I am very interested in, and you know, how we can um, make the best use of our budget for everyone. How about, um, you? Mm -hmm. how about you, Kathleen, a couple areas of interest? Well, so I am that geek who loves local government. Um, I think local government has the opportunity to make really positive impacts in people's lives. Um, and because of my love of local government, I trained as a land use planner and a an historic preservation planner. So um, I've sort of been steeped in, in local government all through my professional life. Um, I'm obviously very interested in things like the code update and the completion of the LWRP. Um, I'm also a, a institutional building consultant and a communications consultant. I'm really good at project management and a lot of what um, the village does is project management um, with these these large, um, the carrying out of large, large plans and, um, and seeing things to fruition. Um, but I also say that I'm a grant writer. Um, I wrote a $10 million grant for the city of Hudson a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of people really hate grant writing. I really love grant writing, so I'm hoping that I can find places to use that skill and help um, support and expand the budget that we have available to do the work we need to do. Because we are, most people don't realize that the village runs on uh, twine and scotch tape. So I'm, gonna, I'm making up things as I go as well, which is probably a bad uh, thing to do, but you mentioned, uh, you know, your interest in local government and uh, being a local government geek, I think was the term used, but I wondered about sort of the role of village government in a way you can look at it as it's the entry level for elected officials in a way. You could almost think of it as single A baseball as opposed to triple A in the major leagues. But do you see like village level government as being like, is it the bottom of the ladder or is it in fact like the top of the ladder? So who are you wanting to respond? Well, we try to go back and forth. So uh, just keep going, Kathleen and Heidi had the first shot last time. So I mean, I, I suppose for some people who want to go on to, to bigger things, it is that. Um, I don't see it as that way at all. I see it as the level of government that most impacts our everyday lives. Decisions get made at the village level about our sidewalks and our streets and our trees and our water, um, all of the things that impact families on a daily basis and our property taxes and how we deal with tourism, all of that is, is very real and very present 
for village families. And so I actually see it as the most, the most important and most, and the place where, where people can have, um, can participate to the greatest degree and have the most impact on outcomes that work well for them and their neighbors. Anything you can add to that, Heidi? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a career politician either. I have, I have a career. <laughs> I'm not, I have no aspirations to be a career politician, but I think, you know, what Kathleen said is true is it's, you know, the great thing about hyper local, local government, which is what I, I think village government is really as local as you can get is that you're making impact right in your community. Um, you're not trying to push these giant agendas. You're really talking about, like Kathleen said, your streets, your, you know, your neighbors, your community. And um, that makes it very, very powerful. Okay, so let's talk about priorities then um, beyond your areas of interest. Like if you can only pick, if you can make real progress on two high priorities in your first uh, couple of years on the board, your first year even, what do you see as the two top priorities that the village has to address? Uh, so I would say for me, where we are right now, 2020, my one of my top priorities is making use of our outdoor spaces during the time of COVID. Um, I think that this is going to be a long term issue. Um, even if there's a vaccine, I think, you know, it's not going to be completely effective. And also we have to think ahead of what other kind of um, pandemics might be in our future. Um, and so really looking at our outdoor spaces, how we can make them safe and still utilize them um, is going to be a big uh, plan for um, for me for the spring and something I'm hoping to work with um, uh, the other members of the board on. We've seen it done very successfully in our local schools. Um, they've done an exemplary job of utilizing their outdoor spaces. Um, we, ha we haven't seen any, you know, massive breakouts. Um, and I think that there are ways uh, that, that we can do that um, as a village. I think one of the aspects of that is that um, the re one of the challenges, I think, for re local residents who want to use the outdoor spaces is the, the number of people who use those same spaces on weekends who are not residents. Have you, have any, have you had any thoughts on... Uh, on that, is it a matter of using the spaces more during the week or have you given that any thought? Uh, yeah, someone who lives on Main Street and works on Main Street, I think about it <laughs> constantly. Um, and I think, I think there's you know a few different ways to look at it. Some of it is thinking about, yes, how can we use it during the week, after school? Um, and then others is, is, is really about um, crowd control, um, parking, all of those things that come up with heavy tourism. Um, and and what's possible some of it is you know you can't you can't close the gates and just stop letting people in um, but maybe there is different ways um, I know that the current village board did experiment with doing one ways on the sidewalks for example things like that um, and I think we might take another look at, at what are what our options are um, but certainly the the problem of crowding in the village ties in I think to everything else uh, that we will talk about Okay, we'll get back to you for your second priority then and give Kathleen a chance. So what's highest on your list, Kathleen? Well, highest on my list relates to what Heidi's saying. Um, I, I don't, I think everyone has felt, everyone living in the village has felt under siege in the last few months. Um, we live in a spectacular place that draws people from all over the region. Um, and no one's, you know, we keep talking, it's the use of the word unprecedented again, but we have seen just crazy crowds. Um, I stood with a clicker on Fair Street two weeks, two weekends ago on a Saturday from eight in the morning until three in the afternoon and aimed to click everyone who passed by on foot and everyone who stepped out of a vehicle that was being parked um, on Mayor's Park. And I know that's, that was, you know, controversial for other reasons, but I, there, I counted 983 people in that period of time. And so that's a probably conservative number because I certainly miss people. Um, that's one street in the village in one stretch of time on a day. Um, and we, we, it is a blessing to live here. I love to be here. I love the mountains. Um, but we have to find a way to protect um, and control access to them. I don't think that we've had a strong partnership um, with the state, our local state parks officials have been wonderful, but I think at a higher level, we need real partnership um, with us at the local level to limit access to our trails. You know, we right now have AmeriCorps 
up on um, the Bull Run approach building steps because the trail has been trashed under the feet of so many people. It's going to be a safer trail because of that work. Um, but in addition to us being mobbed, the, the mountain is being impacted. And so, and our first responders are exhausted. Um, and we pay for those impacts in the village. Taxpayers in the village pay for those impacts. It is great for our merchants and I'm delighted when our stores are packed, but we have to find a way to offset the cost to village taxpayers. And I think in the same way that beach communities do, you pay to park, um, you pay for a ticket to get in um, and access is limited. And so I think we need to ask the state to help us think about our mountains and trails in the same way. Our local economy and our character and quality of life depends on the thoughtful stewardship of those properties so that we can continue to enjoy them. We can't, once they're gone, once they're trashed, then nobody wants to come here. So I think it's in the interest of both residents in the village and uh, merchants on Main Street and the people who, who want to visit here long term for us to be good stewards and for the state to step up and, and partner with us um, more proactively. I was thinking when you mentioned the 950 or so clicks, that was the equivalent of two of those big cruise boats coming up in the fall. Right. Imagine if we had the cruise boats and the other 950 or 1,000 people. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> okay, we're back to you, Heidi. Priority number two. Um, well, priority number two, I, I think sort of bleeds into all that we talked about a little bit about, um, about how to, how to sort of figure out the, the problems of Main Street, um, with our, the strains between visitors, um, and locals. Um, uh, and I, some of that has to do with hiking and, um, as Kathleen said, some of that is working with the state. Um, but some of it I think is, uh, problem solving really locally. Um, and, and the current board has, I think, made efforts in that regard. Um, like Kathleen said, when she stood there clicking, it was sort of a, it was a parking lot experiment to see what the options would be. Um, and, you know, my overarching goal is really um, to improve village life as much as possible. Um, and the one thing we hear most from people is about um, being overrun, parking, people parking cars everywhere, um, and just feeling really like they can't uh, enjoy their village on the weekends. Yeah. Hmm. Um, one of the constant concerns and complaints is the lack of uh, sales tax revenue, sales tax revenue coming back from the county that the village gets none, I think $7,500 for ostensibly to help with garbage collection, but with the lack of tax return from the county, from sales tax, to me, like the village board's hands seem to be pretty tied in terms of what they can do to help merchants on Main Street. Have you given that any thought? What? To what we can do to help merchants on Main Street? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a major problem that Putnam County robs us blind. <laughs> we bring in so much tourism um, and they they keep all the all the sales tax as a, as a business owner. I find it incredibly frustrating. Um, you know, there are some long term options in terms of uh, what we can do to um, you know, establish ourselves with the county. Um, but that's a really, that's a much bigger fight. Um, in terms of short term options for Main Street business owners, um, it's, I think, I really do think that parking can make a difference in terms of uh, locals getting frustrated, um, uh, visitors getting frustrated, and really just like circling and circling around. Um, and that ends up being a revenue stream um, as well. So it's something that it wouldn't that we're not then saying, oh, people are just coming here for the hikers and the um, and the shops, and then we're spending more money. Actually, the goal is that you know these visitors, they're a benefit not only for um, Main Street businesses, but for for the village as a whole, and that the community is really getting something something back from from that popularity. Great, thank you. Kathleen? I think it's important for people to understand that tax revenue sharing in New York State. Um, is not required by counties unless the county has a census designated city. There is exactly zero motivation for Putnam County to share with us at all. Um, and 
how do we change that? Well, you would hope that you would have partnership. It is certainly not for lack of trying on the part of village and town officials and our legislators. Um, both re recent legislators have um, made an attempt to work on this. Um, unless, unless there is some motivation from the state level, I don't know what, uh, what pushes Putnam to be motivated to share. Um, so we, we, we may, maybe we need some help. Maybe we need some help at the state level with that, and and you know some demonstration of of numbers um, and um, you know the real the real shortfall that we have at the local level and in our our village budget because we are host to um, tourism that is being so steadily promoted at the county level with no help for our infrastructure costs. Tourism is not, I think I said this before, but it's not going away and we need to find ways for it to monetize for us very locally and that includes sales tax. So would you see parking as, uh, I can't believe actually I did not, I did not include a parking question per se in my, on my list, but uh, so would you see you know parking and charging parking more for parking and making more parking for pay available would seem to be one way that the, that the village could increase its revenue to help pay for some of the infrastructure to deal with tourism, whether it's garbage cans or whatever. But do you see parking? That's one source. You know, that's that's sort of low-hanging fruit. And of course, it's been talked about before. I think um, one shopkeeper mentioned that she'd um, had conversations about it with the board 30 years ago. Um, it has been something that folks have not wanted to go forward with because in the past it involved, you know, real physical impact on Main Street to have meters. We're not, it's not like that anymore, right? The technology has improved to the point where we can have muni meters periodically up Main Street um, and be able to, to monetize those spaces and keep turnover happening. Part of the challenge is people parking on Main Street and being there all day and not creating new. Um, I think we do need to think about um, the potential for um, remote lots. I don't have an idea in my head for where exactly that would be, um, but I, I think about um, in the Adirondacks um, at, at near trailheads that are very packed, you'll have a remote lot in a field and a bus into the trailhead or into the village, um, reducing the number of cars that are in and it's a pay per ride. Um, you know, we have this, it hasn't operated since COVID, but, you know, the county has, has invested a significant amount of money in this trolley. I'd like to see that trolley be used for things that are actually helpful in the village, um, like moving, moving around the masses of people. Okay, a resident uh, had a question from, they live on Lower Main Street, and they said it's sometimes so busy on weekends on Lower Main Street, but they had to use the municipal parking lot by the Riverview on Ferret Street because mm. they can't find a parking spot below the tracks. And um, they're wondering what can be done about that. I actually thought there was already a residential parking program below below the tracks. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't still quite understand why the residential parking um, district hasn't been completed. I know that it, it had to do with the the way that, so, so the way it works in New York State, similar to, to tax law, is that the state has to pass enabling legislation to recognize a residential district, and then 20% of the area in that district can be reserved for residents. Um, I, don't, I don't fully understand why in the last iteration the state passed the enabling legislation, but the, the district was not launched. I don't quite understand that, but to me that has to happen at the very beginning. We have to get that right. We have to reserve spaces um, for our residents first. It's not going to satisfy every problem. Most people in the village, you know, this village was built before cars for the most part, the densest parts of the village, and most families have two or more cars. Um, and we, we don't have enough linear foot feet, and, and we can't, within that 20% restriction, provide on-street parking for every resident. But we're not the only village that deals with this issue. Um, and we certainly have neighboring neighboring communities that deal with remote parking and deal with resident permits and do it as a matter of course. Um, I'm hoping that some of those folks, I'm thinking um, particularly of Margaret Parr, who I think is, works in the village of Mamaroneck perhaps, but she has um, a great wealth of knowledge about how we make, um, how we make resident parking and lot management 
happen. And I hope that those folks can will come together as part of this parking committee that Dave has called for. And we can finally tie up some of these loose ends and get some common sense approaches. It will never be perfect. We will never be able to provide a parking space for a reserve parking space for every car in the village, but we can start easing some of the burden, especially, you know, I think about people on Church Street and Garden Street and yes, Lower Main, um, who are swamped. Okay, I'd like to change gears now and talk a bit about the um, the upcoming review of the Cold Spring Police Department and its policies, which has to be undertaken as part of Governor Cuomo's uh, uh, order. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts on it are overall and are there a couple specifics that you see that need to be included in that document that would be unique to Cold Spring possibly or to address Cold Spring's needs? From what I understand, going way back when Cold Spring first got its zoning put in place, it was essentially a cookie cutter approach from a community on Long Island that they basically imposed zoning from another community on Cold Spring. So I think we don't want that for the police department. So what are, what are your thoughts on what ought to be included in that police review beyond some of the nuts and bolts that, uh, that have to be there? But I guess, as I understand it, the, the, the document will have to bring Cold Springs police department policies in line with state guidelines, but there may be items and issues beyond that as well unique to Cold Spring. So what are your thoughts on the police review? Um, Heidi first, I guess, please. Yeah, well, being able to do this, um, you know, as a small community, I think gives us a lot of opportunity um, to do it right and to have as many people as we can involved in the process. Um, I think being a small village is a real advantage here. Um, so there are some, you know, broader strokes that I, I think are, can be applied. Um, from other parts of the county, from other parts of the state. Um, but in terms of Cold Spring itself, um, we have an opportunity where we can really know every single one of our officers. You know, I think that um, is a really important part of the process um, is that residents know their police officers, police officers know their residents. Um, and I think that in includes, um, you know, freedom of information requests. Um, as part of the uh, repeal of 50A. Um, I think it includes just simple meet and greets. You know, I think uh, um, especially we've seen how easy it is to do things on Zoom. Um, even that is, is a, a nice step. You can stay right in your home and, and get to know people. Um, and so I, I, I'm actually really looking forward to the process. I mean, Kathleen has an incredibly comprehensive plan. Um, if you've been on her website, you may have seen it. Um, and I'm really over the moon to to be working with her. Um, she's a very organized mind um, and uh, I'm in full support. I mean, you know, there are always going to be a few things here and there, um, but I think, you know, the main thing for me is community involvement in this process because you can't have that good relationship if people don't know each other. Um, and Officer Burke has been incredibly um, welcoming of this process. And so I think we're very lucky in that regard um, that we really, we have the opportunity to work together as a small community. Great, thank you. Kathleen, what would you add to that? Well, I think it's important to acknowledge first what has been done, what is going on with the current trustees. Um, so in yes, in a way similar to um, to zoning, we have a sort of a cookie cutter policy. It was last updated um, in 2013, and that is before the current trustees now. They are reading it and, and sort of getting a sense of where we are, where we're starting. Um, and Larry Burke, who um, is our officer in charge, um, I, I, I think Larry is the perfect person to be leading the department right now. He is deeply committed to community policing and knowing um, knowing the community he polices and making sure that they know them and he has a strong moral compass and while um, we don't necessarily have the uh, community traumas that other places have experienced he recognizes that there's always place for place space for improvement and I think that that's really critical to, to have a, le a leader with a mind toward um, openness um, and and um, a courage to look hard. Um, the, the challenge of the executive order is that it is 
you know, it's a huge order that scaled for large municipalities. It was pushed out very quickly. It comes, as with many things from New York State, with uh, orders and, and no money to help local municipalities carry out the order. So we're already at a disadvantage because our budget is already really tight and our human power um, within, within the staff um, is tight. We have a part-time police department. Um, most of our officers are retired from other departments or they work currently in other departments and work with us part-time. That saves us money um, in terms of benefits um, and retirement, et cetera. Um, but it also means we have a, a lot of people in and out and no, you know, it's, it's a lot for Larry, Larry to be managing the team, let alone taking on a full <laughs> rehab or update of, of the policies. So in order to do this right, um, as laid out in the executive order, um, it, this is meant to be data driven um, so that so that there are mutually agreeable and objective facts to start from and that a community can um, identify the problems we're solving for. I think it's really important for us all to recognize that um, we're not going to solve national issues wholly um, in the update of a local police department that has not um, been a department that has inflicted large-scale community trauma. I think we have to be clear about that. Um, but we can set a pace and we can be an example and we can lead by example to say these are the kinds of values we have as a community and as a police department serving a community. Th this, these are the values that we want to reflect um, in our policies. And I think the great failing of of this executive order, it is rightly, it is rightly focused on race, but what it neglects is all of the things that our police officers are asked to do as a result of a failure of policy and a failure of governance, right? We ask a lot of them, we ask a lot of them in terms of dealing with mental health and dealing with poverty um, and dealing with a, a, a whole range of things that are almost impossible to think of any one person dealing with on their own and we don't give them enough resources to do it. So I hope that as we go through this process, we can, as we've done in other ways in Phillipstown and Cold Spring, innovate. I think about the, the Climate Smart Project and how we stopped waiting for the county and the state to solve problems and we came up with solutions on our own. And I think we have that kind of opportunity here and we have a community that is really willing to engage thoughtfully um, and that's the key to doing this right, is making sure that we have people with lots of different perspectives. I hope there will be, we have a lot of police families in this community um, and in the surrounding community. I hope, I hope those folks will be at the table too to talk about um, the human side of, of policing from that perspective. Um, and it's really, this is gonna be hard. Um, it's gonna be hard because we have to do it together and that means we have to listen. Um, and that means we have to work from a place of calm. Um, and I think we can do it. I think actually Cold Spring and Phillipstown are really good at that. So one of the uh, viewers tonight asked if uh, either of you have a specific thing you think needs to change with the police department, be added to it, or any, any specifics at all? A single thing? You want to take it first, Heidi? Um, honestly, I, I don't yet. I, I need to see um, more data. And as Kathleen said, it should be data driven. And, um, you know, we have 12 police officers and, and what the village board needs to do as part of this, um, as this process is really look at our crime rates, our crime solve rates, who's responding to that. Is it the Putnam County Sheriff's Department? Is it the Cold Spring um, Police Department? What percentage of, of crimes in the village are solved? So I don't really have um, any one issue other than that I, I feel that I need to learn more um, and also get to know the department more um, before, before jumping in. That's fair. Kathleen, any specifics? Um, I would agree with Heidi. Um, I would also say that I think um, we need to make sure that as we do this work, we're remembering that we need to see how our department functions from different perspectives, right? Those of us who live in the village and know our officers and their officers know our, you know, the officers know our kids, we might experience those officers differently than people um, traveling through. So, so a, a sort of a very, a varied perspective um, of who it is that's interacting with our police and how. Um, I, I know 
in my own experience that when you know our officers, um, they're, they're very impressive and they bring a wealth of experience from, from other departments. Um, and, and they are, they do seem to be people who are committed to community policing. So I'd like to have one of the things I thought about the current doing, <laughs> throwing out an idea for you, is a profile of an officer or two officers a week. You know, meet meet your officers, and you know what what do you like to do when you're not in Cold Spring, and what's your favorite dog, or you know something that something that helps to make those folks not just uniforms because they're not, but makes them accessible. Um, to the folks in the village. We've actually talked about that and uh, we'll take that as a nudge. I would right. just add though that we should also keep in mind that, um, you know, how nice someone is as a person doesn't necessarily reflect um, how good they are at their job, how they treat people they don't know. I mean, I think that it's good to come from that place and, and it's certainly getting to know people, but I think it is, it is important to keep in mind too though that, um, you know, there are, there are different elements in place there and different factors that that ultimately um, you know reflect uh, on the department. Thank you. Okay moving on to the comprehensive plan. Um, I'm wondering Heidi I don't think you were living in the village yet but when the plan was approved in 2012. Kathleen were you in the village yet then? Yeah I was part of the special board for a time. That's right okay so the village uh, comprehensive plan was approved in 2012 for my money, I think it was it was the most extensive volunteer effort that I've seen in my time in the village. Um, incredible levels of involvement, including I think a 20% response rate to the first initial survey that was sent to every resident, which is, I've done surveys where if you get a 2% return, you're happy. So 20% was phenomenal, but the plan for the most part is sat on the shelf and I'm just wondering is it still relevant? Should it be looked at again? It's now been eight years since it was approved. And what are your thoughts on I that, think Kathleen? That first, you're not right about that at all, actually. Yeah, didn't we just get another survey? Hey. Say that again, Heidi. Didn't we just get another comprehensive survey? I just took one. Oh, you took one for the town. That was yeah, for the town. town. Yeah. Okay. So, so Michael, the reason I'm saying, and I, I took a few notes here. So if I look up and down, it's because I'm, I'm wanting to refer specifically to objectives that were in the comprehensive plan. It's, it's simply not true that the plan has been sitting on the port on the shelf. Um, the village has been working toward goals and objectives um, since the plan was adopted in 2012. It may not happen in ways that are obvious on the street every day, but I can tell you a little bit about my experience um, as part of uh, as a member of one of the standing boards for how we have over time implemented and continue to implement the comprehensive plan. Um, so I sit right now on the Historic District Review Board for another few weeks. Um, we reference the, the, the comprehensive plan as a way to set goals and objectives um, and as a reference point in our decision making. Um, so, so specifically, objective 1.6 said, improve the HDRB process by increasing public understanding and making the process more user friendly. So we use that objective as a foundation for grant applications um, from the State Historic Preservation Office. We received two grants and the first one updated the ordinance for the first time since 1976 and a few variations along the way. Um, and we use the second grant to rewrite the design standards. They're about to premiere. I'm very excited about it. They are much more user friendly. We really heard what the public had to say. We stopped sitting, except for public hearings, we stopped sitting behind um, the, big, the big table where the judge sits and we sit at, at the table with applicants so that we can all review documents at the same time and together and be conversational and neighborly. Um, so that is one very direct way. Another, another um, objective was 1.5. Um, encouraging adaptive reuse. We've seen that happen at 178 Main Street and at the Kemble House. Um, and of course the code update that's happening right now as we speak every week endlessly. Mike, you know you sit on those calls with me, right? It's painful. It's so painful, but it's happening and the Village Board is, is undertaking that work and that moves us closer to achieving objective 5.13, improving village zoning. So, you know, it's, it's far from being um, on the shelf and there are critical elements that have been implemented and it's important to remember that comprehensive plans are aspirational. Um, it's not meant to be a detailed, a detailed, it, it is very detailed, but it's not meant to be a roadmap for one step after another. It is meant to be a collection of, okay, we as a community came together at a 
20% response rate in one of the in one of the surveys, we came together and we decided that these are the things that are important to us. These are the goals we're going to set as a community, and these are some objectives we can set about. Um, so, so now um, the village board has moved on to the sort of on the on the ground guidance documents that that make the goals happen from the comprehensive plan. So. Um, so we're work the, the trustees are working on the local waterfront revitalization plan. It has slowed a bit during code update because there are five people who can only do so much during a day, the day um, and, and the night. Um, but when that is in place, that will require that federal and state actions taken within our waterfront zone. And because we're so tiny, our waterfront zone is defined as the whole village. Um, that will give locally um, determined criteria that those agencies, the state and federal agency, have to follow when they're doing work in our waterfront. So, so the comprehensive plan has set the stage for all that. Should it be revisited? Absolutely. I mean, these are not intended to be forever documents. They're intended to be updated every five to ten years. It's meant for the community to pause and say, all right, let's look at what we did last time, see what we've achieved, is it still relevant? Are the goals we set in 2012 still relevant? And if not, how do we change them? It's meant to, to push us to communicate with each other and recognize what our common goals are and then get us going for the next round. I know from, from the outside, it can seem like a comprehensive plan sits, but it doesn't. It moves forward in ways that maybe not aren't exciting. And this is where this is where we come back to the local government geek in me. It gets played out in ways that aren't necessarily exciting, it but not, it does set not, a roadmap. It may just not be identified as having been part of the comprehensive plan. Right. And so, so sometimes there'll be specific um, conclusions or or um, decisions made by a planning board or a zoning board or a historic review board. Well, they'll refer back. A, a good example is 126. Main Street, where the, now the um, endless gain is, that the lot, the parking lot in that area, were it not for the comprehensive plan, would have been asphalt. It is now a permeable driveway that will accept rainwater. That's a direct result of a goal and an obje objective set in the comprehensive plan. So it's happening. It just may not be in ways that you recognize every day. So don't say it's on the shelf. Please. <laughs> I did you have anything to add before we move on? Uh, just that I had a lot of fun taking the Phillipstown Comprehensive Survey, uh, Comprehensive Plan Survey. So um, I think it'll it it could be a, a another fun project to see uh, what the villagers have to say. Yeah, and I think that it's a gr it's a great time for us to learn. There are people who are village residents working on that plan. And they are innovating in lots of ways in terms of data gathering. Yeah, let's learn from what they're doing and see how we can build from there. I think in the original plan, in the draft of the plan, it was suggested that it be revisited every 10 years, I think it was, but that was actually taken out. Um, yeah, before. and I don't remember, I was thinking about this, that this afternoon. I don't remember why the trustees took that out and you know, speaking with my planner hat on, I think that was unfortunate. They're not meant to be forever documents, they're meant to be revisited. And so I hope that we do. Okay. First, the first priorities though, in my mind, are getting the code update done and getting that before the public for comment, getting that wrapped up, getting the local waterfront revitalization plan before the public and approved, and then coming back and saying, okay, we've done the big projects. What remains? What do we need to change? So I'm going to move on a little bit and combine a question from um, one of the viewers with one I had. Um, my question was about uh, short-term rentals, Airbnbs being the uh, brand name, if you will. There was a great public meeting last year on the subject and uh, some really passionate discussion, but a lot of consensus, I think. And um, But there, I don't think there's been much of any progress on setting policy. And one of the viewers asked if things like parking fees and Airbnb permits um, could be used as a special fund um, in the general budget that is transparent and is used to, I guess, used to help fund the things that relate to tourism is really what it would boil down to. In other words, use a permit fee for Airbnbs or the parking fees, use that revenue to deal with some of the structural issues that the village has to face in dealing with all these visitors. It's like I think it's Heidi's turn to go first, yeah. Heidi's, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, <laughs> there's no reason that we can't, uh, you know, have as many revenue streams as possible. Um, you know, permits for Airbnbs, I think, uh, or, you know, short-term rentals. I think that's one possibility. Um, you know, personally, uh, I think that in the village, we have um, more people wanting housing than we have housing. Um, and that um, there can be fair regulations put in place. I think Beacon has done a really good job um, regulating short-term rentals there. Um, and uh, I think that there are smart ways that we can uh, allow people to use their primary residence um, for short-term rentals without having developers buying up, um, you know, apartments and and houses and just using them essentially as hotels. Uh, so permits could be one way, but um, for me, I would argue that. Um, if you are doing a short-term re rental, it should be your primary residence um, and, uh, and that you are available to the community or, you know, uh, some sort of someone in your stead. If you're away, you know, if you're on vacation, you want to rent out your house for a week, that you have someone appointed um, to deal with, with any issues that may come up. I mean, you know, if, if you are, if it's your primary residence, you're invested in your neighbors. Um, and I think that's for me is, is the, um, is the crux there is that um, you have regard for your neighbors and, and what kind of, uh, what kind of street you're creating. Kathleen. Um, I attended that meeting as well. There was a lot of great energy and, um, and really great, ideas and what seemed to be of greatest concern to me what that I heard was um, protecting neighborhood character um, you know folks saying look we, we moved here to live in live in a neighborhood we want neighbors um, we want to know who's next door and we want to know that the people who are next door are invested in the outcomes and sort of the venture of community that we're here for um, and I think that's totally reasonable I think we have two options right now um, one is to enforce the existing code, which does not reflect the reality on the ground, right? It limits where short-term rentals can be. Um, it, it defines the kind of spaces they can be, and it does not reflect what's actually happening in the marketplace. All you need to do is, is look at um, any of these short-term rental websites to see that they're all over the, all over the village and run in all sorts of ways. Um, so, so I think we have to be real. Um, and even with tighter enforcement, it's it's unlikely that short-term rentals are going to stop. So um, it's it's too the, the income is too valuable for people, and so I think we're better off with thinking about an option two, um, which is some of what Heidi has said. Um, we I think that we need to. I don't believe that the that the trustees have made no progress on this. I think that the progress they were making has been eclipsed by COVID response. It's been eclipsed by CUC. I it is my understanding that it is their intent to develop a short term rental. I would make the argument that this doesn't need to be super complicated, and the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. We should look at um, ordinances in. Um, similar communities. Rhinebeck has a very strong local ordinance and we should put something before the public and we should have a public hearing and vote and get that on the books rather than waiting for the whole larger process of the code update, which is is, is necessarily slow. Um, things that I think are important to think about in a local ordinance um, is establishing a limited number of short-term rental units um, and requiring operator permits. I agree with Heidi that um, it's important that it be, um, that, that the person be in residence. Um, I think that we need to establish, a, this is again coming back to the idea of monetizing visitors. Um, we need to establish a fee structure for permitting and for renewals and an inspection structure. Um, so that we're also, you know, we're, we're making sure that the spaces are safe, that people are safe when they're in the homes, that they're up to fire code, and that we're also collecting fees for those inspections. Um, I think that it's a, one way to, that one thing that we need to think about is with owner occupancy that we limit the number of days that the house can be rented out. Um, so I don't know what that might be. Maybe it's 14 days. And, and folks also who are running Airbnbs need to be thinking about um, how this impacts your, your um, income tax, <laughs> right? If you're, if, you're, if you're living 
out of your house more than you're in it and you're collecting property on it, that's a property income. And that there need to be real implications for that as well. Um, I agree, a local agent. Um, and I think a, a local tax on transactions would be critical as well for the, the, the cost of the night per night, you know, in the same way that communities do hotel fees. The, the, again, the challenge in New York State is I believe that that needs it's to be enabled by state legislation, state enabling legislation. And so we need to, you know, get in touch with our assembly members and say, help us out here. Let, uh, help us be able to levy this local tax. We're getting close to the end, I think, but I'd like to sneak in at least one more topic, one question. Um, the Cold Spring Boat Club is, it has a three or four, I think, years left on its lease with the village and is interested in renewing, but with a very long-term lease up to 25 to 30 years in part, I believe, so that they might be in a position to um, reestablish a building on the site as a club center, club headquarters, whatever. I don't, you know, the boat club was established in 1955 at a time when I think riverfront property was seen as of very little value. Um, and I don't think, I don't recall any public input or public uh, meetings on the boat club and what it is in the village and how the lease should be or what it should be. So I guess my basic question is, to what extent, if any, should the public be involved in a longer term lease being issued to the boat club for 25 or 30 years? Is this one me? I'm sorry, I've lost track. You, yeah, I think it's you first this time. Okay. Um, well, that's not quite correct. Um, during the comprehensive plan process, there were design charrettes for a number of locations around the village, including the waterfront, um, and the boat club property was um, under discussion by the public then. So that is one opportunity that the public had. And then as part of the, you know, for, for folks who, who haven't been here as long, the, the, um, the it was a cult, it was a site of, um, it's a former manufactured gas plant, and there, there, there was contamination under the ground that needed to be removed. That's why the building is gone, so that we could get as much of the contaminants out of the ground as possible and protect the river. What remained was capped, and we, are, we now have the lot we have. Um, and so during that process, the public review process for that um, mitigation process and that um, I don't remember what it was called, the something of agreement. Um, <laughs> there was public comment during that portion as well. That's different than how do we use, how do we use the space going forward? Um, I think it's really important to recognize Cold Spring has some really special institutions. And I think the boat club is one of them um, because it is an accessible, it, it is, it, it belongs to the village. The land belongs to the village. The club ha has traditionally been made up of village residents and some Phillips Town residents. It has been moderately priced um, compared to other privately run marinas on the, on the river or municipally run marinas on the marina river that are more expensive. I sort of think of it as the working families access to the river and I think it's really important to maintain, sorry, sirens going by my window. I think it's really important to maintain um, an affordable access. No. Do I think that, uh, first of all, I think a, a long-term lease, if you're going to ask a tenant to improve your land and your asset, you need to give them the length of time and sp to be able to do that. You don't ask someone to build a building on a five-year lease, right? That wouldn't be reasonable. So I think that we do need to think about if the boat club is to continue to be the tenant, as I hope it is, I think you have to look long-term in that way. Um, I think that it's perfectly reasonable, not for the public to be involved in the nitty gritty negotiation of the lease, but for the public to, sit, to say things like, when you establish, when you, when you sign the lease, can we have um, an opportunity to have boats that are not pow powered under motor and are rack stored um, on the site as well, things like canoes, kayaks, windsurfers. Um, and can there be a fee structure for folks who are, right now you pay an initiation fee and an annual fee and you work a certain number of hours depending on your level of membership. So can there be a level of membership for folks who have boats that are not under power and, and, a, and a work schedule that makes, that is um, in accord with that. Um, so 
I want to make sure we protect and preserve the boat club and that in in making in continuing the lease we keep the spirit of the negotiations that happened around the remediation and the, the spirit of those negotiations was this should remain publicly accessible a village asset that all villagers can access we can it's a matter of making that um, availability known to a larger audience and the more people we have residents we have engaging the river the more local people we have caring for the river over time and that's that's critical too is building that base of of river keepers small r yeah heidi any comments on the yeah, of the i mean I, I think that there there's you know public land for public use um is something everyone would agree with and that um as kathleen was saying you know the boat club does give an opportunity for public use you know the, the village doesn't have money to just develop um you know our waterfront into um our wildest dreams and and the boat club um does provide opportunity specifically to residents and i like that aspect of it um the most recent iteration of their application that i saw um you know says you have to have two current members vouch for any applicant um i would like to see it really um you know when as we move forward um i would like to see it feel as though um if you're a resident here you can get in um and also maybe thinking about um what the rates are, you know, um, I, I think as Kathleen said, it seems to be reasonable. Um, but I do think it's important to think to the future and just say that it's really important as a community that those who want to use the river, it, it remains affordable. Um, so, you know, I, I, it has a long storied history, not all of which I know. Um, but I do think that there's real value in, in having space there that's uh, specifically for resident use um, and that hopefully more and more people can can take advantage of it and and that a lease renewal would encourage that um, rather than make it a more you know private restrictive uh, club. I think we also this is another one of those great opportunities for low hanging fruit on um, revenue mm -hmm. right now. Um, so that the, the docks are T shaped and and the, the perpendicular portion the short end is the tie up end right now it costs nothing to tie up there unless you are spending the night um, and um, it's easier to it's easier to keep track of people who are staying overnight because the boat's there all night and it's easier to, to charge etc but otherwise i could come from anywhere on the river and tie up in the morning and stay in cold spring all day this seems like yet another opportunity for um revenue generation maybe it's a municipal maybe it's another um, muni meter you know i think i think part of the challenge here is that the boat club from what I understand, from what members have told me, they're totally fine. And they think it's very, very reasonable and right to charge people to tie up in Cold Spring. They don't want to be in the parking management business. And I don't blame them. So how do we, it is our property as a village, how do we, how do we find a way to manage? And maybe it is a simple solution like muni meters. I don't know, but I think we need to talk about it. So we're going to wrap up and go back to something that Kathleen started this session with, really talking about how the we function as a village really of volunteers uh, helping each other out and making take the village to make the village run kind of thing and one of the viewers was asking um, how can you how can we meaning you i guess encourage residents to volunteer and um, especially newer residents who may not be tied into the village as much as some longer term so what what can be done to increase volunteerism in a community that already is very, very, if not totally reliant on volunteers. Uh, Heidi, do you want to take a shot at that first? What can be done? Yeah, well, the village board has all kinds of great um, committees. And as Kathleen said, they're reviving the um, parking committee. Um, and I think there's actually, there's a lot of opportunities here for people to get involved in areas they care about. Um, you know, I am one of those, I think, newer residents. I've been here three years, so I think that would make me, you know, a, a brand new newborn here in the community. Um, but, you know, I, for me, I think it's a village that invites participation. Um, and some of that probably has to do with being um, a Main Street business owner and being on Main Street. But I think, um, you know, I, I think 
there are great issues, like people get fired up about parking. So I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of volunteers for that parking committee. Um, and I think that one thing we can do as a village board, which I really, um, you know, I think it, I think it is a challenge. So I, I certainly don't fault the current village board, but really make those meetings um, widely advertised, really appealing. Um, I'm not saying anyone's going to want to sit through two hours of, of code update, um, but, uh, but they, you know, make sure that people know you can come to the village board meetings, you can comment. Um, there are things you care about. It, this is the easiest place to, to, to really participate. Um, so, you know, I, I I haven't thought specifically about marketing. Um, maybe we could play some ads in our local paper, um, but I do think that there are, you know, I, uh, there are a lot of motivated, um, interested people here. And, and I think we see that from the tree advisory board, right? I mean, that um, was something that people really cared about and came together and, is, and has been such a benefit for, for our village. So I think there are, um, I think there there are ways forward, and and um, and it will actually be uh, it'll be a lot of fun to work with everyone. Fun is a good concept, Kathleen. What would you add to that? I've actually thought about it a lot um, because I think <laughs> I know it's shocking. Um, the, the 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 model for volunteering in the village is that you commit to five years of sitting on a board, um, mm -hmm. whether it's the zoning board, the planning board, the HDRB that's a sort of an, an intimidating first rung on a ladder. I would like to see us um, think about sort of think tank opportunities and single serving volunteerism opportunities where we say, okay, we have this issue that we need four people to really think about and come forward with proposals on and find sort of bite-sized ways for people to engage. Because the reality is most people don't want to whether they have the time or not, they don't want necessarily to commit to five years of service, but they might be willing to work in a project-based way. So I'd like to find ways to create smaller steps on the volunteer ladder that get um, more people <coughs> engaged. Um, that sounds great. I, there, was, there was something else, but it's gone. Well, that's a good, good point to end on, I think. So thank you both very much for uh, chatting. I think it's been enlightening and uh, I enjoyed it. Hope you did too. And I hope did. Thank you. Viewers enjoyed it. So, Thank until you. we meet again, Teresa, yeah. it's up to you. Thank you both so much for joining tonight, for being so generous with your time. We went over quite a bit, but it was, yeah, it was a great conversation. So thank you both. And uh, we'll be posting the recording tomorrow on YouTube. So if anybody missed it, we'll be posting the link and that can be shared um, easily. So yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.